Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And, and I actually uh, got a specific request from Forrest to talk about the history. So I will do mostly from the previous millennium and, this, and we'll, we'll uh, resist the temptation to talk about our exciting latest stuff, which I'd happy to talk about later on. Anyway, uh, setting the stage, since many of you are not environmental microbiologists of the sort that I tend to do most of the time, perhaps some of this is new for you. Um, I'm going to be talking about naturally occurring communities. They're very, very messy. They're not nice like pure cultures. They don't behave for you the same way. And people don't understand them that well. And uh, it was, as we've heard earlier, people thought they were relatively unimportant up until about the 1970s, and oceanographers and such didn't even pay attention to bacteria up until then because they thought they were numerically very small and unimportant. And how did that change, and how did viruses get included, which is basically what I'll be talking about. So it was a very nice paper by Larry Pomeroy in 1974 that sort of gave a lot of great information about how this sort of classical food web people, the people thought the way it used to be working actually had this other stuff outside of it, uh, which had a lot of uh, flow of carbon and nitrogen, et cetera, through dissolved organic matter. Uh, it was a great paper. It had a lot of interesting evidence in it, which was pieced together. And it was way too early, and people didn't pay attention to it. Uh, but within a few years, people like Ferguson and Rubli uh, and Hobby and their colleagues were able to use new epifluorescence techniques and find bacterial abundance was about 10 to the 6th per milliliter in seawater. That meant bacterial abundance, when you multiply it by their biomass, would come up, uh, per cell would give you a total biomass that might be 10, 20, 30 percent of the biomass of the whole system. So suddenly they had a lot of biomass. And the question was, well, is that biomass active? Are they turning over? And uh, some early studies looking at the growth rates of microbes in natural systems, so these are mixed natural communities, uh, were very difficult because, see, these weren't cultures, thing, a tiny fraction of these things grow in culture and culture conditions aren't relevant. So what is their growth rate in nature and how do you measure it? And one of the early studies was uh, Hagstrom and Larson, and they looked at frequency of dividing bacteria, which was rather tricky by epifluorescence because they're just little tiny dots and you're trying to find when the tiny dots are starting to divide. But they did some interesting work there. And then for my dissertation work with Farouk Azam, we were looking at the DNA synthesis rates in mixed natural communities by tritiated thymidine. And what we were finding were doubling times on the order of a day or so. And when we multiplied that by the biomass, we came to the conclusion that the bacteria were consuming a huge fraction of the total carbon in the system uh, on a relatively rapid basis. And Azam et al. Uh, had a very nice paper that summarized this that was a result of a conference. And here's the authors. You see Freda Tingstad, who just spoke as one of the authors here. And that article was very, very heavily cited. Uh, and it showed basically that bacteria utilize 10 to 50 percent of the carbon fixed by photosynthesis. And they said in that paper they were controlled by nanoplanktonic, which means very small, in the order of 2 to 20 micrometers, heterotrophic flagellates. So that was the conclusion they had then. Um, and in fact, this is a nice figure from Farouk Azam sort of summarizing that concept where DOM is dissolved organic matter and it gets from all sorts of processes and the bacteria end up getting that DOM and that's why they get so much carbon because they're really good at taking dissolved organic matter from the concentration you'll find it in seawater, which is actually very low. Most substrates are nanomolar concentrations or less. So my research as a graduate student, and <laughs> most of you will recognize the hairdo uh, back then, we all had more hair and less weight. Anyway, um, I was a grad student from 77 to 81 with Farouk and studied uh, bacteria systems. Uh, I have lots of stories. Forrest said to tell some stories. One story I'll tell you is when we were doing epifluorescence counts of bacteria, the paper that was published said how to do it, but it didn't say to use non-fluorescent immersion oil. And for about a full year, we were doing it with fluorescent immersion oil. No one knew otherwise. There were no pictures in the paper. They said nothing about it. And we had these bright bacteria on an almost as bright background. And we, Tim and I were able to count them. And there was one student in the lab that could never find the bacteria, never found the focus, and would make slides for us and would sort of try to fool us, saying, aha, this is a blank. They'll never see it. And we always got the counts right. Uh, and eventually, a Norwegian colleague came and visited and said, what? You need to change that. And he said, use paraffin oil. And suddenly, it was like night and day. We had a black background and bright green bacteria, and it was a lot easier. Anyway. So uh, 
The work that we did looking at DNA synthesis, though, was very well received. It's been cited thousands of times now, and the method has become very popular, and other methods have, have uh, gone to uh, show very similar results. After my graduate work, I was trying to follow up on this, and I was looking at things that were eating bacteria and how, they, how this system was working, the things that were eating these planktonic bacteria in food webs, and how there was couplings between the nutrients of bacteria and the things that ate them. And this paradigm that we followed was that they were being eaten by grazers. Now, my first graduate student, George McManus, who's now a professor at University of Connecticut, was doing several experiments. And in one of them, we used penicillin to stop the growth of bacteria and watch the bacteria disappear. And the disappearance, we thought, was because of grazing. And the experiments seemed to work beautifully. When you added the penicillin, you'd watch the bacteria disappear. If you filtered out the grazers, you'd get a reduced disappearance rate, but they still continued to disappear, even when the grazers were gone. And we said, aha, something's going on there. And we did experiments using eukaryotic inhibitors, cyclohexamide and colchicine, and found that that would stop the, pre the predators from eating the bacteria. So it, in the experiments, we had beautiful flat lines when we added those, and we had this nice decline over time when we just uh, added the penicillin. And oddly enough, even in 0.6 filtered seawater where there were no eukaryotes at all, we had like half the, the loss rate. And we got this paper published in Science, which was about, looked, it looked like it was about invisible eukaryotes that were less than 0.6 microns. Most people don't know this paper because almost no one cites it, okay? <laughs> uh, and uh, in fact, well, we said in that paper, our apparent evidence for bacteria-sized eukaryotic grazers may have resulted from activity of a lytic bacteria phase sensitive to both cyclohexamine and colchicine, although to our knowledge, none are known. As far as I know, none are still known. And the last sentence was, however, major shifts in our view should await confirmation of the enigmatic findings reported here. They were not confirmed. And I think there's a notation in science under my name that says, don't ever accept a paper from this guy again, because <laughs> we've never published in science. I've got a lot of papers in nature, but not a single one in science since then. Anyway, so. Uh, but George did some really good work, and he and many other colleagues were carefully measuring the grazing rates, and we carefully measured the growth rates as best we could, and there always seemed to be some kind of missing mortality. And it didn't happen all the time, and many other colleagues were finding this. And we said, well, what was the mechanism of that mortality? And I had a suspicion that it was viruses. Now, viruses were known to happen. There, there had been a lot of work on cultured marine viruses going back early in the 1900s. But direct observations of viruses in nature were very few about where they were and how abundant they were. Although John Seaberth had a beautiful set of pictures in a book he published in 1979, a nice big coffee table type book, um, which had a lot of great information besides you know, pictures in it. And in there, there were nice pictures of viruses you could find in seawater, and even what he reported as a cell that was infected with viruses. So provided a lot of ideas about possibilities. Now, unfortunately, a few pictures are not proof of their importance. For example, pictures of people being eaten by sharks doesn't prove that that's a major source of mortality for people. Okay? <laughs> Just finding a picture doesn't tell you much. You really need quantitative data and the way to interpret it. Now, Torella and Morita published a paper in 79 where they counted viruses in seawater, and they reported counts of only about 10 to the fourth per milliliter. And it's hard to have an impact when the bacteria were 10 to the sixth per milliliter. Now, why did they have such low counts we know today? And in fact, if you look at the paper, you'll see that they concentrated their viruses on 0.2 micrometer filters. The large majority of viruses went through them, and they just way underestimated the counts. It was a great idea. Uh, one other thing, by the way, if you look at it, one of the figures in their paper were these things that they called a chain of hexagon virus particles. I think those are magnetosomes in that picture. Anyway, so the missing mortality got me really interested in it, and I was looking to try to find the viruses as this. And at this point, Lita Proctor was applying to graduate school. She had done a master's degree with Larry Pomeroy. And I admitted her to the lab largely because she was an experienced electron microscopist. And she actually had taught a course in electron microscopy as a graduate student. She knew it really well. Uh, here she is, Lita. Most, many of you might know her now as the director of the Human Microbiome Project at NIH. So that's what she's doing these days. And here she is with my postdoc, Curtis Suttle, and my technician, Amy Chan, who's Curtis's wife. Uh, and they are doing great virus work. They still, for many years later. Uh, Anyway, so with Lita, we started to develop methods to concentrate the viruses by tangential flow filtration, observe them, and count them. Okay, so we're looking in natural samples, and Myron Ledbetter at Brookhaven is very helpful on this. And at first, we tried to quantify them by mixing virus-sized latex beads in with the samples, and then concentrating them together, and then spotting them onto grids and staining them and counting 
the grids, uh, the viruses and the beads and comparing them and uh, trying to express them relative, in a relative sense. And in fact, we also did virus concentration experiments where we would add concentrated viruses to seawater and see what happens to the bacteria. And we found the bacteria declined significantly. Uh, so we found often a 25 to 50 or 60% decline in bacterial counts in one day when we added like five times virus abundance. So we in fact reported this first in a, a meeting in 1988, and this ab the abstract, by the way, got online in the year 2011, even though we did this in 1988. <laughs> but it was available in libraries until then. It's the only way we had published it in back in 88. Uh, the early counts in that papers were quite low. We know now that counts are more like 10 to the 10th per liter, so that concentration technique still was not quite ready for prime time. Um, but we did talk about the, the relatively high counts, and much higher than what they had been previously reported by Torella and Morita. And then we also should, we reported that when you added these viruses, we had a big decrease. Uh, we didn't publish this immediately, though, though I gave the results a lot in a lot of seminars, and I was just talking to Fred Tingstad at lunch. One of the places I gave that seminar was at the University of uh, Bergen, where the people were kind of interested in looking at viruses at the time, and they jumped on it and got very excited and started working very quickly on counting viruses. But we were looking for a smoking gun, something more than just high counts. In the meantime, my colleagues in Norway got their methods going rather well, and they developed a really nice technique to directly centrifuge the viruses onto an electron microscope grid from only a few milliliters as opposed to the liters that we needed for our work, so it was very easy. It was also very direct since it was like an endpoint type filtration, and they got the counts right, they got nice high counts, and they reported in Nature in 1989 that there was a high abundance of viruses as we know today. There's similar numbers on the order of uh, a few times 10 to the eighth viruses per milliliter in natural waters. So, and they also did some calculations by, based on absorption rates, and they made some assumptions. For example, there were 100 strains of bacteria, each one equally abundant and uh, you know, infected by these viruses. And with that assumption, they calculated that there was a high infection rate. But that assumption, of course, was very hard to know at that time. And these days, we know that's not really how things are, but it still is a useful assumption. Now, that smoking gun that we were looking for, we actually came up with a different way to look. And what Lita and I did was looked at thin sections of the bacteria and looked for viruses in the final stage of infection where you have assembled phage inside getting ready to break the cell open. And you could look inside them and find what fraction of the cells were visibly infected. So we had to get a lot of water. We had to make pellets from that water, do embedding and thin sectioning. It was a lot of work. But we came to the conclusion that up to 70% of the prokaryotes could be infected based upon a model that I'll describe in a minute. And the data demonstrate existence of a significant new pathway of carbon and nitrogen cycling in marine food webs and have further implications for gene transfer between marine microorganisms. This paper was published January 4th, 1990, so it came out the next year, in fact, the next decade after the previous paper. Although if there had been a paper published between Christmas and New Year's that year, it would have come out in 89, in any case. So uh, the model that we're talking about was pretty simplistic. We were, consumed, we were looking at the percent of visibly infected cells, and we want to know the percent of mortality. And what we needed to know to make that conversion was, first of all, what fraction of the infection cycle is visible? At what point are these assembled phages visible in the microscope? And we looked at some of the literature at the time, and it suggested it was about the last one-tenth of the infection cycle. Next, we needed to know about how long is the latent period compared to the doubling time of an uninfected cell. And then we looked in the literature again, and the number was about a generation time. They were in the same order of magnitude. We also made an assumption of steady state, which means that the system, this abundance stays steady over time, which means of every two daughter cells, one will be killed and one will live. And that means that a mortality that kills 50% of the cells is causing 100% of the mortality. So if we take those assumptions and we multiply the small observed numbers of infected cells, which averaged about one to five percent, we come up with numbers that about um, up to half of the mortality in these systems was being caused by viruses. Now, there were later adjustments to these and various tweaks to the math, et cetera, but the results came out very similar. Now, shortly after this, other labs said, my goodness, it's really hard to do these thin sections. Why don't we try it an easier way? We'll just look at them when we spin them down onto a grid and try to see if we could find the assembled viruses inside. Now, that certainly shows you things, and I always made the joke that it was kind of like looking through a shower curtain and imagining a lot of what you're seeing. 
because it doesn't give you the detail of a thin section, but it certainly gives you a lot more ability to get a lot of data much more rapidly. And people that did the confirmation experiment showed that they were reasonably good to do that. Okay. So within a few years, there were several other methods that independently came to the same conclusion, and many of them were done in our lab and many were done by other labs, that there was a significant amount of mortality. I should also point out that there was a large uh, number, a large amount of data that just was correlative data that suggests that the viruses were mostly bacteriophages in these natural systems, based upon how they correlate, especially over depth profiles where the protists and things go way down in abundance, but the bacteria stay high. The viruses were roughly 10 to 1. We found uniformly 10 or 20 to 1 viruses to bacteria, or I should say viruses to prokaryotes. Many of them turn out to be archaea, especially in the deep sea. So what were these other methods? One was to look at the decay rate of viruses. And if you know the decay rate of viruses in the absence of new, new production, excuse me, if you know the decay rate, then you can make an estimate of how quickly the viruses are replaced, and that's a production rate. And if you know how quickly the viruses are replaced and you know the burst size, you can estimate how many bacteria were killed by those viruses. So that was one estimate. Held all brat back and others did a lot of that work. Then there was effect of added viruses when you add into the system, like Lita Proctor did, Curtis Suttle did, and others. Another way was to label bacterial DNA in a natural system by adding tritated thymidine in a very small concentration, so they use it all up. And then you have labeled DNA, and then you watch that DNA decay. And that DNA will decay even if you filter out the protists. And we don't think that bacteria that are normally reproducing actually lose DNA, so we said that's some kind of mortality mechanism. Okay. We also looked at dilution of fluorescently tagged viruses. So here you take viruses out of seawater, you concentrate them, you make them fluorescently tagged, you add them back to a seawater sample. Now you watch them get diluted by unlabeled viruses. Those unlabeled viruses are produced by new virus production. And that dilution rate then allows you to estimate how many new viruses are being produced. So that was a technique that my graduate student Rachel Noble shown here was doing. We also looked at viral DNA synthesis. That's a technique that Greg Stewart and Farouk Azam developed, where they detritiated thymidine incorporation into viral DNA. We also looked at techniques where you reduce the viruses by selective filtration. So you have just the bacteria concentrated over a filter with the viruses reduced. And then you watch, watch the sample replace the viruses by new infection that happened inside the water you already had. And that is another way to look at virus production. All of those methods showed virus production was very abundant and that mortality was important. And in fact, we published a paper in 1995 where we very carefully looked at protist grazing and looked at virus infection by three different techniques and came to the conclusion that the mortality of the bacteria in the natural system was approximately the same between those two mechanisms. So those are the ways that we were able to conclude and convince people by lots of different directions that the viruses were not just some quirk, they weren't just inert, they weren't just the, the something that looked like viruses that really weren't. These things were really active and they were doing things in the system. Okay. So a little bit later, people said the TEM is kind of tricky. How do you do TEM work all the time? And we instead developed epifluorescence techniques to try to look at these things. I won't talk about it in a lot of detail, but uh, first Curtis Suttle's lab have a technique using a Yopro dye that worked well, but it took a day to make each slide. So that was too slow. We developed a technique that it was about 20 minutes to make a slide using cyber green. It makes all these really nice pictures as well. Um, and what did it mean for understanding the system? Well, I'll briefly just talk about some of them. In the entire system we're talking about, many people think about viruses and mortality mechanism. But they also have positive aspects to the system as well. First of all, as we all know, they promote gene exchange between microbes and therefore they foster and, and help adaptation. We also know that because when viruses break open cells, they release dissolved organic matter, that actually feeds other bacteria. And when we look at models, which uh, this is one we published in a, a, a review in Nature in 1999, turns out that when there's viruses active in the system, the bacteria get more growth than if the viruses are less active. They basically steal production that would go up to fish and such and keep it down in the bacteria size fraction. You also realize in the ocean, nutrients are in short supply. And if they sink into the deep sea out of where the light is, they're gone. Viruses are a reservoir for nitrogen, phosphorus, and perhaps help the conversion of other nutrients to keep them up in the water column. So having a virus active system keeps the production higher in the system. Uh, and then we've just heard Freda talk about how viruses help maintain the diversity in the system by a variety of mechanisms that I won't go much into. 
So just sort of updating that figure from the early, nine, from the early uh, 80s, we can add viruses in here and look at them and see how this little side loop of viruses where they infect mostly bacteria but also various protists, they basically move material down into this part of the system. And the last thing I'll do just as a teaser is show you that when we're doing work now using DNA analysis of the community composition of bacteria and viruses, we find that the association networks of the different kinds of bacteria and viruses are remarkably different looking than the association networks between bacteria and protists. They're very tight. These are bacteria and T4-like viruses, looked at a time series over multiple years. And this is a uh, similar network, but using the protists and the bacteria. And you see it's a much looser network. And here it's because we think viruses have a much more specific relationship with particular hosts, whereas protists have much more general relationship. And this is one of the things that determines what's going on in the system and how things are controlled. And those of us that are looking at pure cultures all the time, and it's a great way to do a lot of work, you have to realize natural systems look like this. They don't look like your cultures. And there will be a lot of things that regulate the system that are very, very hard to simulate in a culture situation. So they really do complement a lot of those other kinds of studies. So I'll leave it at that.